Hi, the first fly that I'm going to be doing for you is a spinner. It's a CDC spinner. And I'm going to begin the thread so that I build a thread foundation. The reason I do that is because if I have a bit of a thread foundation, I'm going to have less slippage of materials. And so I don't want this slippery shank. So I'm going to do a little bit of an odd application of the thread. Instead of the conventional application of thread where I wind around and wind back, if I do that on this fly, and I typically tie this fly in nothing larger than a 16, and for demonstration purpose here, it's a 14, a Daiichi 1110. And because of the smaller sizes that I tie this fly in, I want to make sure and uh, have as less, at least amount of bulk as possible. Now, in this particular fly, you're going to go, well, why does he care? Because he's going to build it up with thread. Just for education purposes, keep that in mind, please. It'll just really make a better end product if you know where to apply thread, when to apply thread, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and I'm kind of mumbling on, but I think you'll catch on as we move along. Let me take my thread, and I'm going to reverse the direction of the thread. Instead of the conventional direction, I'm going to reverse and bring my thread around the eye. Then I'm going to put it where I want it to be, and I want it to be just a little bit shy of the bend of the hook because of the way that we'll put on the tail. I'm going to wind on two or three winds and simply throw the thread in front. I'm going to pull the thread tight, and now I've got it locked in place. Now to keep this little stub of thread from winding on around with every wind of thread, first of all, I'm going to make sure and apply my pressure in the proper location. I'm not going to put my pressure here because that winds on around the shank of the hook. I'm going to put my thread pressure here toward me so that in turn it pulls the material directly into place. I'm going to wind about halfway up at the shank. I'm going to take our thread and simply put our scissors in and slice it off. And I've sharpened the points of my scissors so I can come in tight and do that. I'd rather not use the edge of the blade. I'd rather use the points of the scissors just, just like that because by getting the points in, I can get a little bit sharper cut and it tucks that thread back underneath. I'm gonna, you're going to periodically see me spinning my thread in a counterclockwise direction or possibly in a clockwise direction. Every time that I take a revolution around the shank of this hook, it's going to put a clockwise bend or clockwise twist in the thread. And what I mean by clockwise, We'll move back with the camera just a little bit, and I'll just put my hands down here. And you're going to see that I'm going to be looking down on the face of a clock. Down here in my fingers, at my middle finger and index finger, is 12 o'clock, and up here at my thumbs is going to be 6 o'clock. So as you can see the bobbin holder right now, let me pull it up a little bit so you may be able to see it. It's just, it's unspinning itself. And it's just naturally doing that because of the twist in the thread. Being a right-handed tire, every time I take a revolution around that shank of the hook, I'm putting a twist in it. Twisted thread produces bulk. That's why I'm concerned about it. I want to make sure and reduce that amount of bulk as much as possible. Now, I want to make sure that my thread is basically at a halfway point on a 16 or bigger. And again, I don't like to fish this anything bigger than a 16, but um, this is a 14. So for demonstration purposes, I'm going to be a little bit further forward than halfway. All right, now what we're going to do is put on the tail. The tail material is going to be most anything hard that you can come up with. This happens to be off of a bull elk neck. Another option besides a real hard natural hair would be micro fibbits, and you can go the cheap way, go to your local paint store and buy a paintbrush. These are great, and uh, they do a good job. Okay, we're going to take our hard hair, and we're going to clip off two, and I'll do different colors. I hope you can be able to see that. I would normally pick a similar color, but just so that it, it makes it a little more contrasty for you. Clip those two hairs off. Now we're going to align the hairs, and it's a little tricky sometimes to align hairs because if you grab hairs at the ends of the hair and pull them up, they won't slide in your fingers because the natural scales on the hair resist that direction. So what I like to do is I take the hairs and I'll, I'll simply separate them down here, put my scissors in, and clip one of them off so that it's a little bit shorter than the other one. Then when I pull them and even them, and I, I hope I can get this so that you can see, when I pull them and even them, then I can see the length of the two. If I grab one wrong, then I can pull the other one and I, you know, I just even them up. And they slide this direction much better than toward the tip because, again, those natural scales resist that. Now, let's go ahead and put on our tails. We'll measure them to length, and this is a spinner, so you can make them long or short or however you want. And I'll just measure to length, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply clip them off to the length that I want them to be here. Now, the trick here is to make sure that your thread lays precisely on the butts of that material. Well, my hand's way back here. If I have twisted thread, now remember, if we're winding, we're putting a clockwise twist in the thread. And by the way, almost all brands of thread come pre-twisted. That's just the way they are. And so they have a clockwise twist naturally within them. 
So if you have that clockwise twist as you come forward, see how the thread kicks forward? A lot of pain. So if you simply counterspin or counterclockwise spin that thread until it becomes flat, you can come right over the top, capture the material, lay the thread precisely where you want it to be, and wind on down. Now we'll wind on back down. Remember that when we mounted the, uh, and I'll counterspin it again just a little bit to flatten it. Remember when we mounted the thread, we began right here. The reason is what's coming up next. I want to tie on back on bare shank. That's very, very important at this point. Bare shank. Now, why don't I put a ball of dubbing back there? Well, it's a spinner. He's already lost its eggs if it is a female. I don't want that showing. So I want to make sure and have a clean area. It's always bugged me, no pun intended, that uh, these big balls of dubbing, it just doesn't look good, or a ball of thread. So I came up with a method of forking these tails. And there's several ways of doing that. This is just one way. I want the tails to just bend very, very slightly down. I'm going to spin the bobbin holder slightly counterclockwise so that there's a natural loop that goes back underneath the tails and just reaches underneath the tails. Remember, a clockwise twist went to the front. Remember that just a few seconds ago? Counterclockwise is going to go to the back. I'm going to force the tails separate. Now, remember by having, well, you don't remember, by having bare shank back here, what happens is it's going to slide slightly on that slippery surface. We talked about that earlier. Well, now it's where it comes to fruition. We're going to pull and separate those tails. Now you can see the left tail is kicking up. The right tail is kicking toward me. I have them separated. I come back between them with my thread, pull this tail toward me, pull the left tail away from me, and now my tails are forked. Now we're going to take a rib material. In this case, I'm just going to use thread. And we're going to take the thread and trap it underneath. Now instead of trying to apply this soft material, and try and capture it on this side with a thread, why not let the thread trap it itself? I'm just going to pull up, and the thread's got it. Now I'm going to simply slide it back into place, and we're going to proceed forward. Now I'm going to do something at this point. We'll just cut off the tape here in just a second to just speed things up, but I'm going to be building up a layer of thread here to build a tapered body. You notice that little butt of thread stays put because I'm putting my thread pressure away. We'll stop here shortly, but I want you to know what I'm doing, and that is I'm going to just build, like floss, a thread, thread layer, a taper in the body of this fly. And we'll proceed on, and you'll catch up with me in a few seconds. All right, now we've got our body tapered, and again, that was just simply flattened thread that I uh, build a tapered body up with. And next, we're ready to wind on the rib. And you don't have to put on a rib, but I like to put on a rib. Why didn't I dub this section? Well, once again, if I'm tying this in the size that I typically fish at 16s down through 22s, then it just builds a lot of unnecessary bulk. So typically, I probably wouldn't fool with a, a dubbed body. Uh, the, the thread, the, the tail's going to support the fly on the water. The wing's going to support the fly on the water. The dubbing's not going to really add anything particularly to it. You can certainly dub if you wish to. I've got just a thread material that I'm going to put on as a rib. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to twist that thread of a contrasting color in a clockwise direction. Now, as you remember, when we mounted on the tails with that clockwise twist that I showed on the thread, it wanted to kick to the front. Well, if I spin this thread in a clockwise direction and wind in the conventional direction over the top toward you, then what you're going to notice is this material, this thread, is going to just naturally go that direction toward the eye of the hook. You'll see in just a second. So I don't really have to judge the placement of the winds. Why am I twisting it? Number one, it will go where I want it to go. And number two, it strengthens it slightly. And if you do have a dub body, it will cut down into that dubbing and, and bury it just a little bit deeper. We're going to spin it in a clockwise direction. And how much? You'll find out quickly enough. If it's not enough, you'll find that the winds are very tight together. If it's enough, It'll just go exactly the amount of se segmentation separation that you want. If it's too much, it'll just jump to the front. And I got lucky. It's just about right. And that was 53.2 wines. I'm sure you all counted them. And it doesn't take a great deal of, of effort on my part to place it because it just kind of falls right into place pretty much where you want. We'll just go ahead and tie it off. Now again, we can control this little stub by simply putting our thread pressure. Now if I push it over the top, it's going to climb over just like that. But if I put my thread pressure, sorry, now i got it all twisted together. If I put my thread pressure right there, it stays right there. But if I put my thread pressure on the top, it climbs over the top. And we've already discussed that. Put a little tapered, or just put a little foundation of thread and clip that off. Now we're ready for the wing. 
What we're going to do is take two small CDC feathers and we're going to put these CDC feathers tip to tip. I'll align the ends as evenly as I can. And then I'm going to clip out the tips and I'm going to clip them out just enough that it makes about a wing length. The reason is this rachis, this shaft, is going to get in the way for the way the wing's mounted otherwise. So I'll just clip out those tips. Now I'll take the feathers in my fingers, I'll grab them by the quill, and I'll simply slide those barbs down together until they extend out just like that. I'll bring my thread back to where I'm going to mount the wing, try and keep it fairly smooth foundation. I'm going to mount the wing about right here, lay the wing material slightly toward me, let the thread come up and over and capture the material, wind back a couple of winds. I'm going to push the wing back and see if it's the length that I want. It looks like it's just a little bit long, so I'm going to slide it this direction. The trick is, with only two or three winds here, if I slide back, it's going to jump those winds back as well. So I'm going to pull, so instead of sliding straight back, and I'm going to avoid that by sliding up and holding onto the butts or the tips of the wing at the same time. That way the thread stays put and I get the wing to where I want it to be. I'm going to check and make sure I have it far enough back. Wind down some more firm winds all the way back to where the abdomen of the fly was. Double check. Now, there's the stub that I trimmed off, so I got it just about the right length. Wind my thread back toward the front. Oops, sorry, caught some of the wing. And just push that up by a few thread winds. We're just going to try and build up just a little bit of a taper right there so it sticks up. So there's the beginnings of our wing. Now we're going to put on some dubbing. I'm going to twist in a clockwise direction. Well, that probably makes sense by now because remember, every time you're winding around the shank of the hook, you're putting a clockwise twist in the thread. So by twisting the, the dubbing on in a, in a clockwise direction, it actually will tighten very slightly. If you dub in a, in a counterclockwise direction, you'll notice that frequently you have to retwist your dubbing to get it to apply. Also, I've dubbed it on flat threads, so now I can take my finger and simply slide the dubbing right up into place. Take my wing, push it back, start building just a little bit of a platform in front of the wing very slightly. Pull all the barbs of the wing forward. Try and pull all the barbs of the wing forward. I'm going to capture a couple of them, sorry. And I'm going to need a little bit more dubbing. The way I like to dub, I put on a small amount of dubbing and then always add to it if need be. I look at it as, think of it as sort of like a gold leaf and then you'll dub accordingly. Too many people put on too much dubbing and it doesn't lock. It'll just actually fall right off the thread. You can interlock the dubbing by putting on multiple layers and it'll stay put. But if you put on one big clump, it falls right off frequently. Just going to proceed on down forward. Now we're ready to fork our wing and make one clump go to one side, the other portion of the clump go to the other side. Simply split it down the middle. You can take your thumbnail and kind of press it back and see which barbs need to go which way. Then we'll take almost like a wing case, pull these over the top, come around with our thread. Firm up the winds. Now we're going to come underneath, counterclockwise spin the thread to get it good and flat. Reason being that when you pull up the whip finish knot, frequently if you don't, it will knot onto itself and break the thread. This way we'll have winds that will not loop up on themselves. You notice how the loop doesn't spin onto itself, it doesn't furl. Take my scissor point, slide in, pull the knot back to firm it up. Take the scissor point, slide in. Trim it off. I'm going to take the wing, trim the wing butts off, almost like a little head. Now, the tails have bent out of shape. They're a natural material. Once this fly hits the water, 
they will fork back out again. So don't worry about it. They're just fine. Also, some people like to trim the wing. If you'd like to, feel free. Uh, but that's basically the finished product.